what we are called to do is persevere. So we're called to persevere for the Gospels and for the message of spreading love to all corners of the earth. That's what we're called to do. And so another way to put this and is we're called to do our best to remain righteous despite life's inevitable pain, suffering, betrayal, disease, setbacks, chaos, confusion, and death itself. We're not called to succumb to the spirits of anger, bitterness, envy, hate, jealousy, pride, resentment, and vengeance. That's really, really, really hard. I know it is for me. I won't speak for everyone else, but that's really hard for me to follow through on. And so it's not going to be a cakewalk. We're told in Scripture, actually, that it's going to be harder than ever before. We're told that um, Apostle Paul gave up his Cush life as a high-ranking Jewish official, kind of mentioned that already, to become a Christian and be persecuted, beaten, thrown into prison, and eventually have his head cut off. Wow. And I and I apologize. I'm gonna be real honest. My the guy I'm running from just texted me about my laundry. So I was looking at my at my watch. Anyways, back into the scripture. Next, right, we're called to persevere. Matthew 4, 11, 4, 1 through 11. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. So Jesus gets baptized and immediately the dove comes on him, the Holy Spirit comes on him, and then he's tempted by the devil for 40 days. And after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. And the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, Again it is written, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to them, him, all these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, be gone, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. Then the devil left him and behold, angels came and were ministering to him. And so we see immediately after Jesus gets baptized, Satan comes and starts tormenting him, starts torturing him. And I think that this is beautiful imagery because what we're told, and you can kind of rationalize and think through this, but this, this is my, these are my thoughts on it. Before you're baptized, you're living through a certain worldview and a certain perception of the world. After you get baptized, you become aware of things that you weren't aware of before and so a lot of the old temptations they're still there they don't just magically go away you're just more conscious of them whereas before maybe you were unconscious of them you felt something was just off or why change why become a follower you felt something just felt off you felt anxious you felt depressed you felt that you were in in, in toxic habits maybe destructive habits and then after getting saved, getting baptized, there was a light shined upon those old habits. And so now you have to wrestle with them. You have to get through them. And, and you've heard the old saying, once an addict, always an addict. That, that self is in there. And what you're doing is you're working to wrestle with it and rewrite the narrative of your life. Like the past self is still a part of your story but it's not a part of the next chapter. And that's what this is showing us, is that even Jesus himself, even though he was sinless, he had to wrestle with temptation. He never gave in to temptation, but 
we're going to have temptation. It doesn't mean we're baptized and we're all automatically just cleansed of everything, pure. It's exactly opposite. It's almost harder because now we care about some of these things. Now we care about being less than we possibly could be, all that we possibly could be. We're aware of it. We're conscious of it. We elevate it. We care. And so let's go ahead and move on. 2 Corinthians eleven twenty three through 30. Are they servants? And this is Apostle Paul. And again, I'm talking about persevering and persecution as a Christian and in kind of what we're called to do in this perseverance. 2 Corinthians eleven twenty three through 30. Are they servants of Christ? I am a better one. I am talking like a madman with far greater labors, far more imprisonments, with countless beatings, and often near death. Five times I received at the hands of the Jews the forty lashes less one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I was adrift at sea. On frequent journeys in danger from rivers, danger from robbers, dangers from my own people, danger from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers, in toil and hardship. Through many a sleepless night, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure. And apart from other things, there is the daily presence on me of my anxiety for all the churches. Who is weak, and I am not weak? Who is made to fall, and I am not indignant? If I must boast, I will boast of the things that show my weakness. And I want to continue on quickly to the next scripture because we just saw Apostle Paul was beaten, shipwrecked, stoned, imprisoned, ridiculed. But look what he follows it up with, right? So that was 2 Corinthians eleven twenty three 23 through 30. Shortly after, in 2 Corinthians 12, 7, 9, this is what he follows that up with. And we kind of get a precursor to, because he says, who is weak? And I am not weak. So this is 2 Corinthians 12, 7, 9. So to keep me from becoming conceited because of the suppressing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from becoming conceited. Right? Because he's just talking about, I am persevering through all this persecution for the gospels. But I can't let my pride swell up. And then he continues on. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me the thorn from Satan. But he said to me, and this is profound, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Think about that. The fall of man. Let's take out the theology. Pain, suffering, heartbreak, betrayal, disease, death. These are all human realities. But what Apostle Paul is saying is, by persevering for the Gospels, and what is the message of the Gospels? It's saying to love God, the Spirit, God the Father, which is Spirit, which is love, truth, and light. Love Him. Love your neighbor as you love yourself, despite life's inevitable pain, sufferings, betrayals. Don't succumb to anger, bitterness, resentment, hate, and vengeance. And when you do that, you glorify God and you make his power perfect. And we know that in a sense. When we see people who don't throw in the towel, right? We, 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 we tend to call it the hero's journey. When we see someone who's been knocked down again and again and again and again, but they still have a smile on their face. They're still serving others. They're still thinking about others. They're still grateful. That resonates deep 
intimately with us, with the human soul, with the human spirit. It calls to something deep within us. When we see someone who's disabled, still grateful with a smile on their face, not complaining, but doing everything they can to be the best version of themselves. That calls to something in us. When we see a soldier come home after losing limbs and they're positive still and they're still loving on people, that calls to us. It calls us up towards something. And what is that something? It's our highest potential. And that exists inside all of us. And that's what 2 Corinthians 12, 7 through 9 is trying to say is my grace because even even let's say you don't believe, again take the theology out of it the probability of you being here right now having a conscious human experience the probability there are about two trillion universes I believe the physicist Brian Cox said two trillion um, galaxies I mean not universes one universe two trillion galaxies so the Milky Way is a galaxy. The Milky Way is a galaxy. We know of no other planet that has life like this. And so the fact that you have life, whether you believe in a God or you believe in the universe, the fact that you're here is such a low probability, it could be deemed a miracle. And that grace, the fact that you're here getting to participate in the human experience, that grace that you were given, that is sufficient for you. So be grateful, rise up, continue to do your best to love yourself and love your neighbor and to be grateful for that, for that gift of life. And when we do that, again, it, it, it opens the eyes and I'll just speak of myself. I won't speak of other people, but what I've noticed in myself and when I observe others, it does call to us and it rises up and it makes us question of, man, how much more could I do? How much more could I give? And so when, when you're going through those hard seasons, remember that. That if you can't do it for yourself, do it for your neighbor. Because someone's watching you. Someone is looking up to you. And they will take motivation. They will take inspiration from you doing your best to remain righteous despite life's pains and sufferings, and setbacks, and chaos. And that's beautiful.